talk a little bit about machine losses and, and, the, and the measurement of those machine losses and why that's important. One of the things that we found in that WA study was that the, the front losses were actually a lot higher than we expected. So I mentioned that, that the barley losses um, you know, in that study were about 4.5%. Well, half of those were straight off the front. Any idea why that might be? What are we doing wrong? Okay. Cutting too high. Cutting too high? Possibly. Ah, yeah. that, that, that could be what we're thinking. So, I suppose when we're thinking about the context of what we're trying to do here, and it's important for the, the, the things that, that Cassie and Brett are going to talk about later on, is the front's really important in the context of make sure that we feed the machine material the way that it needs to be fed. Okay, so what we're talking about doing is we've got feeding it with lumps and bumps. We want nice, smooth, even flow all the way through the machine so that if there is um, you know, material there that's coming in in large lumps, it's not going to be the limiting factor for the capacity of the machine. Okay, so that even feed's important. What could cause uneven feeding? Well, think about the first thing that's going to touch the front. Crop divider. Now in the UK, where you got blokes are, you know growing bloody, what are you growing now? Twenty ton. <laughs> I'm done joking, but you're growing some pretty serious crops, right? Yeah, and and so that's what those those crop dividers are typically used for. Those really you know big crops. I know you guys will probably grow some decent crops around here, but what you might find is in the same context as what we're talking about with the machine, you might want to quantify what losses you might have from various parts of the front. So one of those might be. Uh, on the crop divider, and I've seen instances where we get some pretty serious uh, losses off the crop divider, particularly in canola. And you might find that removing that crop divider might be what you need to do. Before we go too far into it, just an idea of what fronts you're running. So, who's running Draper front? Yep. Anyone running a Vario style front? No. Anyone wind rowing? A few? Yep. Canola? Stripper, stripper fronts? Stripper, so. Yeah. Mostly drapers. drapers. We'll yeah. focus on that, and then we'll have a bit of a chat about uh, uh, the uh, windrows uh, and pick-up fronts as well. So, important part about quantifying uh, the losses, and, and particularly, let's use the draper for example, because that's what a lot of you are using, is, is just getting an idea of where those losses might be occurring. So, as I mentioned, on the, the crop divider could be potentially an issue uh, if you are direct harvesting canola. Um, the other place that we, in that study that I was talking about before, that was done in WA, was along the midsection of the, uh, the main draper belts, and then also in the centre where the, where the draper belts transition. So, they're, they're the three areas that we typically look at. So, this is a, a tray that comes with a bushel plus kit, and, uh, and what we can do is get an idea of where we want to place the tray before we've gone in to, to, uh, to harvest. Ultimately, what we want to do is, is make sure that we're not going to a, run over this thing, but also that it's going to capture uh, any losses that are just off the, off the front itself. So what we'd normally do is, is step into the crop, work out where that crop divider is going to be, uh, be uh, cutting and basically put a tray about there. Right. We know, roughly know where that's going to be. We're going to, we're going to place or measure and place one away from the wheels and tyres. You've run over a few of these in your past? Yeah, we did three in one paddock. So do watch out for the big rubber things. Is, is anybody doing any front loss measures? Anyone tried? What are we doing at the moment? Are you doing these ones? Yeah? Who's, who's concerned about front loss? The boss just gets there and his idea of grain loss is he drives behind it and how many hit the windscreen is what it is. How you vary that, I've got no idea. but. That's what we're here for, is to try and figure out. A bit more, yeah, quantification than the pinging off the window. Yeah, yeah I do know a few guys who do that. <laughs> well, effectively, that's how your grain loss uh, sensors work in any case. You know, they're, they're listening for that, for that loss. But from the front, it's actually pretty hard because the machine's not going to tell you what losses you've got here, right? So you've actually got to physically get out and actually do, do, these, do these tests. And a drop page is a good way of doing it. Where are we typically losing grain from? As I mentioned, the crop divider could be a potential issue, so I'd encourage you to have a look at that uh, and potentially take that off if, if that's you know, causing issues. In a lot of cases, it's there to, to divide those big, heavy crops in, in lots of Europe. Um, we think about where else we might be losing uh, grain, and, and again, in the context of that, that barley, um, I suspect that, that uh, real was doing a fair bit of damage. So, thinking about 
that crop flow and, and what parts of the machine it touches as it moves through the front and then into the machine. After the crop divider, which is the first thing that touches the crop, what's the next thing that touches the crop? Fingers, yep. And so what we tend to see sometimes is people absolutely burying the reel in the crop. And I suspect that, that in Bali, for example, and the, and the high losses in Bali we had in WA, um, I reckon what's been happening is we're just absolutely bashing it out of the, out of the head right up front here, okay? So we need to think about how, how deep we're putting those fingers into, into, um, into any, any crop, but certainly for cereals, we just want to be dropping those fingers in sort of 50 mils, yeah? And just lightly pulling it back before the knife cuts it off and then presenting it down onto the draper belt nice and uniformly. We don't want to be bashing that in. If you see paint more off here, it's a pretty good indicator that you, you, you're absolutely burying this way too far into the, into the crop. So just the fingers should be doing the job there. Right, hey, let's talk about real speed. Who uses auto real speed? Yep, and who controls manually? Yeah, a few, right. Why are you controlling manually? Yeah, I don't know really, you just feel like you've got more control than more control. ground speed. And the auto is just obviously hoping that it's gonna do the right job. One of the, one of the issues we've potentially got is that the algorithm written for the real speed isn't always suited to Australian conditions. Um, again, you know, you guys are probably growing a heavy enough crop and it might, might work just fine, but it's worth just having a look. If you are getting some losses up front, just make sure that your real speed is, 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 uh, is appropriate. So real speed typically for cereals should be about 5% faster than uh, ground speed. Okay, and in canola it should pretty much match ground speed. Is that what you guys are doing? What, what sort of speed are you running your reels? What, what sort of speed are you running your reels? I'm trying to make it the same as what we're driving it. Yeah. Same, same as ground speed? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I suppose then also thinking about uh, about finger angle, does anyone adjust finger angle? Yep. What are you guys? What are you uh, on our broad beans, we do a bit. Yep. Yeah. So you make them more aggressive, or? Uh, yeah, it depends. They're, they're pretty wild, the broadies. But yeah, yeah more, more aggressive, and clover, clover's another one too when you're trying to bloody yep. lick it up when it's flat on the deck. Yep. Yeah. So yep. you, you're really raking the material back yeah. in. Yeah. We don't get ripping dirt in, so it's yeah. a bit yeah. of a bump so a bit of balancing act here. Yeah. All right. So I think there might be a couple of things there that you might try. And today's going to be all about giving you guys some options and tools that you might want to use um, if you are finding that you've got some losses. No one's going to give you a silver bullet and say, this is the go-to settings for every crop and it's going to work every time. Okay? So you know, in those angles that you're setting those tines, when you're doing, um, when you're looking at some of those more fragile crops, the angle needs to be directly over the guard. So rather than the more aggressive, whether it's pointing back towards the feed drum and the mat is actually either straight down or 5% forward. So you're actually thinking of this thing is, this is not traditionally used as a rake, unless we've got lodged crops or all that kind of conditions and you've got those sort of circumstances and we've all faced that. Generally, you're trying to use it to pull the crop gently in which relates to another element, which is where you position the reel. So when you're, when you're doing that, where do you have your reel? So in your pulses, where, where's your reel? Is it forward or? Yeah, forward, and more so forward than the knife. Because you're trying but to lift it. Yeah, but then you've got to be careful it doesn't fall up. So you, you, work, you work with the reel all the time, to be honest. Yep, yeah, which is a good point. You're trying to actually help move it in. Um, who, in canola, what are people doing with the reels? Up and in the road, yeah, sort of, yeah, backing up. Backing up, yeah. So literally trying to keep it right out the way and actually pulling it back, so that if you're going to touch it as you as you can, it's already over your over your knife guards and uh, over your knife sections already. So that anything's you're hopefully capturing is falling on your your belts and back in. So that's the kind of the the other element to it. So as we said, five percent forward or straight. 5%, 550 millimeters down, yeah, okay, fingers, and speed wise, ground speed or 5% faster. Right, yeah. So, while they touch our crop, start to pull it in. Next thing that touches the crop, knife, right? What do we need our knife to be? Sharp, straight. You got, who's checking their knife on a daily basis? Yep. Yeah, good. Right. Did well. 
Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good sign. That's a pass mark, I reckon. Um, and just in terms of knives, guys, what are you running? Uh, coarse or fine knives? Does anyone swap them out depending on prop? What are you guys running? Uh, coarse. Coarse? Yeah. Like, uh, the wind rail front is fine. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> um, what are you running knives? Fine? Yeah. Yep. Fred? Give us a rundown on, and, and there are some fronts that run, uh, have dual knives and a knife tucked away. Yeah, so a lot of a lot of Vario style fronts, uh, even the Macdon will have a carriage position for a second knife. People probably don't even realise. Um, one of these days that we did in Western Australia, we had a Vario front there. And um, when I was talking about knives, uh, I opened the door on the end and said, here's the second knife. The guy owned it, didn't even know it was there, and he's had it for three years. So... Um, useful, yeah, if you don't know it's there. Right, why is that critical? Well, in theory, what knife should you use for what crop type? So, for your heavier, um, coarser stems, you know, larger stems, canola, some of your lentils, like we grow a lot of lupins in the West, theoretically it is the coarse knife. It does live better, lasts longer, stays sharper for longer. But for your cereals and anything that you're going to encounter that is green, should be a fine knife. That's the theory. Um, the fine knives in those coarse crops have a tendency to chip and blunt faster. But then we had a fellow yesterday who said they've tried both and they don't reckon there's any difference. So, well, horses for courses. All I know is that if you, if you run both styles, so we've got guys that have got a four fine knife and a coarse knife and they change them between their crop varieties because it's a 15 minute job where they've got a knife stowed in the front so and things are straight and things are straight yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. and you can do a whole bunch of clever little things with a knife to make it slide in easier yeah put a point on the end of the bar shape the bottom corner so it doesn't grab don't leave it all square and you can slide them in on your own Brett the the, the terms of this sharp knife I think we're going, yes, we need a sharp knife. Why do we need a sharp knife? What's the implication with some of these crops? So if, you're, if your knife blade isn't sharp or the edge of your knife guard isn't nice and square and sharp, it's a little bit rounded, all that happens is that, that um, greener material or the finer material will actually hairpin over the um, knife guard and between the knife blade and the guard, it doesn't cut it cleanly. And when that happens, that adds loading to your knife and more often than not, when we get a knife breakage, that's one of the reasons for it. So, blunt edges on your knife guard and blunt knife blades. And of course, the other part of, of having a sharp knife, and the reason it's so important is because ultimately, you're not cutting cleanly, you tend to just shake material out of the head. And that's where you find, you know, where, where we found losses in the West, their whole heads in this tray, on, along that centre drape. So you're, you're, you're seeing, you'll see when your knife's not cutting properly, and your guard's not flat, and you, we're, we're, when we talk about knife guards, we're looking for a five mil gap with that knife guard? The knife guard typically has a five mil gap. Um, the knife's typically four mil section, so there's a half mil top and bottom, roughly, is, is, is the rule of thumb. So if you're seeing worn and, and not sharp edges on those knife guards, it's not the time to change those out. So you need, the other is the, 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 the uh, back of that knife guard. So, the ledger plate's really got to be there to support that knife section, isn't it? So if you're getting wear on that knife section, what's gonna happen with that knife? What are we gonna see it doing? Yeah, so if it's doing this and pointing up and not cutting clearly, it's like that pair of scissors I'm using to wrap my Chrissy prezzies and my wife's going, why are you tearing the paper? If I'm tearing crop, what's gonna happen? Sorry again? getting losses. I'm getting losses because they're coming off. I'm also, that head, instead of landing on the mat as we want, because we want the head landing head first. Head first. So if it's not, what do we start seeing it do? Yeah, and then we start seeing feeding not happening quite right. We want to see it beautifully feeding all day. So that's why we got to go sharp knife section will mean we get better cut. Better cut means consistent feed, reduce losses. And the other element is, if we've got not sharp guards, sharp knife sections, 
We're more, using more horsepower down here. I don't know what the amount is, but you, you're putting it all, you're putting it there instead of here. And that, we don't want that, do we? That's not efficient. The other thing that was brought up yesterday was uh, a couple of guys uh, having a play with knife speed. Does anyone have a, does anyone make any adjustments with regard to knife speed? No. But where should we, any instances where we might want to look at adjusting knife speed? My, my rule of thumb for all of that is the quicker the knife goes, the better it's going to cut, but that's providing you've got a sharp knife. Um, that so also we, comes with uh, higher wear rate. Yeah, sure. it also comes with a higher wear rate. Mm -hmm. So um, so typically uh, in the 90s when I drove a header every harvest for a friend, uh, we would we put new knife guards and new knife in it every single year, but that's because they ran a, a loop in the serial program where half our program was lupins. And so as I said to the guys yesterday, We've done be ahead of front on the ground and push it around all day, um, literally on the ground, put skid plates under it every two seasons, put a new knife in it every year. And when we built the platform extension for that, we spurred the knife up 20% because um, it was so critical to reduce those losses in lupins, um, that knife speed made all the world a difference for us. So coarse knife, good guards, and um, uh, high knife speed. So. Um, and something I didn't talk about yesterday, which I should have thought about anyway, when you think about these things on the run. If you buy a red header in the United States, you can buy it with a variable speed knife drive. In Australia, it's actually fixed. Right? Why would they use variable speed cutter bar in the US? And not here? It is, it's for driving their corn heads and so you can control the speed, but I know guys over there that also use it for harvesting soybeans. And what they do is they wind it up as fast as the darn thing will go. Because it stops bean shatter. So if that if that's a thing to um, if that's a thing to think about then nice speed, you could change it. And one of the guys that was yesterday that we were talking to was talking about doing that, changing the dry pulley size so it increased his knife speed. Yeah. Yeah. A few guys have, have tried all sorts of stuff in terms of uh, adaptations for the for the fingers and, and whether it's a super draper matting. A couple of guys yesterday were using that on, yeah. and, on two uh, sections uh, for the revolution and, and just what they're doing is they're bringing the uh, as you know the draper matting sort of sits here with a, an extension of say 50 mil underneath it and what that does is just sweeps over the, the top of the knife and pulls any material back that, that might you know otherwise have rolled off. And of course, you've got other applications like the duck boot here uh, as well that might be worth trying. And anyone who's in control of traffic might find that, for example, wheel tracks uh, are, are problematic. Um, and they might find that, uh, you know, even just city setting up uh, duck feet or something similar to that, just where the wheels are going to uh, typically have run before, where crop might be a little bit lodged or a little bit um, misshaped, uh, which makes it difficult for feeding in. Uh, it might be worth just using some duct tape there to, to maybe pull material in as well. So there's a few options there if, if things aren't, aren't working uh, as, you, as you want them to. Some guys have found those useful in some of the pulses and where they've got some uh, lighter crops, they're trying to bring that in, or a lodged crop. So using a lifter to try and lift that crop up. Yeah. Anyone used a lifter at all? At home you have? You, what, was your, what were you trying to get up? Just, yeah, okay, it's so all lodged. Yeah. yeah, okay, and you've got the... Yeah, the Yeah, and that helped? Yeah, yeah great. And that, that can work if you're in those certain circumstances. Did you change the angle of cut as well? No, so some guys then change the angle of cut uh, depending on the crop. So um, and a guy who had particular issues with pulses that were down and was cutting at 35 degree angle to try and improve that cut element so they could actually get more of the lodge crop up. Um, and then thinking other one they did was the cut in line with the way it's lodged to try and lift it. Right, well, so in theory we've got everything on the, on the main drape of uh, mats here and they're running towards the center. Um, where, do we, where do we tend to get some losses when we get to this uh, side of things is in between that, that, that drape and mat transition. So the transition between the horizontal to the, uh, to the uh, drape that goes up up to the RTD. Um, and 
Is anyone using a seed saver kit at all? Yeah. Anyone tried a seed saver kit? Does anyone, everyone know what it is? So we're talking about uh, some sections of, of rubber that, that basically prevent leaks. And what we end up with in this sort of arrangement is, is leaks out the side. And as you can see, there's a lot of areas there where you might potentially be losing grain. Tell us about your... Uh, yeah, we just um, put it on last year for direct heading canola. Yep. Yeah, um, it's just advised to us to run it. Just saves a lot of loss out of the centre. Yep. And I guess it seems to work. But they tell us to take it out for cereals, but we haven't taken it out. And it was okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think that what the guys will be saying is try it, test it, and if it's working for you, keep going. So some guys uh, will certainly use, someone was talking yesterday about using foam they put in there, because the reason they use foam, they said, was firstly, it helps. The second is if it goes pear-shaped, foam gets cut and it just disappears, so it's not too much of an issue. So you can make your own solutions here. But the, the aim is to, you know, you look at your fronts and you will see holes there. So some of the guys are going through, they were using, they were bloody sealing the whole thing up at the back. Yeah, the that's right. So, I mean, there's, there's lots of potential leak areas of leakage at the front there. And, and if you've got a, a tray there and you are finding leaks, it's worth, worth addressing those. Cassie, you've certainly yep. um, found that that's a, one of the main issues you were saying yesterday. Yeah, but Daniel just said um, we do recommend to take it off uh, on barley. Yep. And you'll, you'll soon see it when something is wrong with it, mate, because the barley will just pull underneath that draper mat mm. and you'll actually windrow it. Like, you'll, you'll clearly see it. It's night and day between the two. So, And sometimes with the barley, you can go up in the paddock and nothing will happen, and all of a sudden, just like that, you'll start windrowing. Um, it's not that bad on wheat, so we can leave it on wheat. Um, but barley, we do recommend taking it off, and that stops your problem there. But if you don't have any underfeeding, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bar barley is the tricky one for it. Just because of the, the, the sheer biomass. Yeah, and they, they grab, yeah. they hold on to each other, so yeah. as soon as that bell turns around and there's one head that goes underneath it, it grabs the rest and they yeah. just start pulling each other to plug underneath it. So. Good stuff. Yeah. Rightio. Um, there was a question yesterday about, um, about Draper Speed, and uh, I don't know whether anyone's uh, had any issues with that at all, but. Um, basically, what we want to make, make sure we're doing is, is feeding that material in, so it's, it's uh, we're keeping the material continually flowing and not bunching, but also not throwing it so hard that it's, that it's potentially shooting across that centre draper and, and across to the other side, and you might be losing some grain there. So, you know, I suppose again, we're coming back to we kind of keep saying it today: measure, measure, measure. It's it's absolutely important. But if you are finding some losses and and, that, and it's around that centre area, and you've addressed all the leakage, that might be potentially one of the issues you, you might need to look at as well. That's it. So what we're trying to do is, is grab that material, push it down, and then feed it up into the machine. But we also need those fingers to be fully retracted around the other side so we're not getting repeats back over the top of the drum, okay? So, um, Brett, for cannoli, we'd normally bring that up a little bit, say 3 o'clock or a little bit higher? A little bit, yeah, uh, sort of up close to that 3 o'clock mark. I mean, obviously, you know, you guys are going to grow pretty bulky crops, so we know that. We know what you're trying to deal with. Um, so to try and get a hold of that biomass, you need to bring your timing earlier. Um, but it's also so that the fingers are gone earlier at the back so it can transition from your RTD to your feeder chain. Okay? So if you leave them too late, then the, that may carry some product over and it'll go down. Okay? Has anyone had an issue with that, that carry over over the drum? No? Not been a problem? Anyway, look, if it is and if it happens, that's, that's where, you, where to look. The other thing I'd, I'd note with the, with the drum is just make sure it's cleaned out. There were some comments yesterday, Brett and I were having one that, that obviously needed a bit of a clean. It was full of marking material and there's a fair bit going on in there. You, you uh, want to make sure that, that there's no, uh, no build-up of, of dirt, dust and, and foreign material in there. So just give that a clean out pre-harvest. Um, that is probably just a good reminder to think when you, what you're actually doing here is mostly you're running something probably like a 12 metre front there you're cutting with and you're taking that material from 12 meters and you're crushing it down to go into this space here, thinking what you're trying to compress fairly quickly into that space. So 12 meters down into about two and a half meters. Therefore, we've got to think about what speed that drum is doing and what those fingers and timing is working. If not, we're going to get losses. 
You're going to see it getting flicked. You're going to see it not feeding properly. And you can feel it in the machine, can't you? Doesn't feed well when it goes through into the feeder house. Brett, when, when you're thinking between the timing of the feeder house and the, and the drum, is there a sort of speed that we want to try and be thinking about? You just want a continual crop flow. So theoretically, the RTD is turning at the same rate that your feeder chain is. So that transition should remain the same. So, yeah. I mean, they're driven off the same shaft. So it should be time. It should be all right. But probably what is more critical than that is um, a couple of things. So we talk about me, I might as well. So if you've got a machine with two rotors in it, rather than one, the speed of your drape belt is critical to getting your crop. So if you're running in New Holland, you want those, those two drapers to drop their material in two distinct separate windrows, not one. Everyone know why? Yeah. So that Otherwise, again. what happens is it has Sorry. to be re-separated up there. Yep. And so if you're putting it into one and then you've got to separate it again, that's one. The second thing is that think about your feeder chain. Sorry. Think about your feeder chain for a minute. If I've got a big wide feeder like we have on a New Holland, and I go and feed the two flows into one big flow, and I put it up the centre of the chain, what happens to the chain? Stretches in the middle. Yep, if I can try and leave it in two crop flows, yes, it's easier for the machine to separate, but it's also nicer on your feeder chain. Okay? New Holland and Case, uh, sorry, John Deere and Case, you want to try and get that close as you can to one crop flow. Yes, a wider, flatter mat, Right, maybe not two distinct crop flows. Yep, it's just a bit easier on the machine. Brett, what about um, what about a hybrid, something like a class? What do they think to think about there? Um, so with your class, it's got a big wide feeder house because it's sixty inches wide, and it's got a full sixty inch wide drum. Um, a conventional John Deere will have the same two series John Deere, but if you're feeding that in as sort of basically two distinct flows that will work for those machines as well okay the feeder chain will actually flatten that out and feed it in as one big wide mat so think about where that material leaves the draper and goes up the feeder so when we were talking about rtds yesterday one of the machines that we were looking at they had flight extensions on the rtd and it was on a new holland so the flight extension is to bring the material into one flow for a case or a John Deere and on the New Holland they should have taken those flight extensions off because all that's doing is it's trying to congregate the two rows into one row right in the middle of the feeder and then the feed accelerator at the top of the feeder house has got to split back into two again. Which is a good segue to has anybody changed their feeder drum or RTD? Have they changed it out or done any modifications to it? We've got one at the back here. Shorten the spiral up and yep. put more retractable fingers on. Yep. Yeah. And how, what did what crops did you see a difference in? Uh, we haven't operated the machine, but the last operator said it was yeah, it's pulling in the middle and then it was actually putting pressure on the belt and then the belt was slipping. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So we tried to spread it out this year. Yep. yep. Okay, we had someone else who did? Um, yeah, swap out the John Deere drum and put a turbo, Phillips turbo drum, and then put a smaller feed accelerator in. Up the top, just a smaller diameter one, and I think. Is that one the same or the other one? Yeah, okay. So, did, when did you do that? Did you, have you done a season uh, with that yet? We've had the turbo jump for a couple of years, and then we knew how to last year, so put a smaller feed accelerator in, just for doing forward beams mainly. Ah, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, yeah heap different. First time we've ever blocked the rotor in forward beams. Yeah, those blockages there at the start of the rotor are all about the way that you put your material into the rotor. So there's a whole bunch of things that you can think about. And we, we don't think about it. We get the machine from the dealer, we go and put it in the paddock and we drive it and we have these little challenges, but we, we, we don't look at actually the, you know, the backwards reason for it. Yeah. Fred, is it probably not a bad time to also talk about the position of the feeder chain yep. relative to the, the feeder house? Yep. The closer you can get your feeder chain, 
TRTV or your um, feed order if you're running a pickup front, the better. Everyone realise why? So the front face of our feeder comes up against the back of the front. All that material, the RTD is underneath trying to feed it through. The wider that, that gap is between the feeder chain, we have the position where the material can stall. Okay? So the closer we can get that chain to it, the less chance we've got or less opportunity for it to stall, and therefore the more even the crop flow will be. So, feeder house, put a straight edge across it and measure to the to the chain, get the chain to the to the furthest point and measure between that straight edge and the feeder chain. Try and keep it under 25 mil. But that might mean so, we need to add some half links to the yeah, chain. Absolutely. And, and then make some adjustments once the chain stretches. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, so you put the half links in when it's nice and new and as the chain starts to stretch, just check it. Each time you pull the front off, just put the straight edge across it, it takes a couple of minutes. And if you need to, take a half length back out. Okay. So it's a quick, easy adjustment. Okay. The other thing with those is almost all of those fronts have got an adjustable stripper plate you can slide in and out. And that gives you your throat width for your machine. And if you're running a New Holland, you want it nice and wide, the width of your opening. And if you're running a John Deere, you want to bring it inside the opening so that it ends up under the two bits of the feeder chain. So if you look at the feeder chain, you want it you know, a couple of inches inside the feeder chain where that stripper plate stops, because that's where you want your, your product to flow in. And doing those couple of little things will just change the world to the way it feeds. Any other thoughts on, on pickup fronts? If there's not, Cassie, I might just throw to you. Over the last few years, as I'm driving around having a look at the headers, um, probably 60% of our problems was with the fronts. Um, so the fronts not calibrated, um, you've got inexperienced drivers on the machines. These fellas here, they've got locking pins on the wheels and next to the feeder house there. And we've been to machines where those locking pins are all the way in. So our plate is operating with it and the, machine, the front is locked up, it can't move. Um, so if you've got inexperienced drivers, or most of the time I like to pick on backpackers, it's a backpacker they can chuck into the machine and you don't show them how to calibrate it and how to operate it properly. So sometimes, you know, the left-hand side might be cutting four inches off the ground and the right-hand side might be cutting 24 inches off the ground. Like, it's, it's not something... Um, it's, it's something that stands out. You can see the front is sitting like that, but I've made that sitting in the cab. No one told him or showed him how to calibrate it or how to get it level again. He's just chucked, chucked in there and said, all right, push the stick forward and watch out for the trees. Don't eat the trees. Um, so if you do have inexperienced drivers there, make sure that you calibrate it. I've seen real speed as a big drama, also with inexperienced people. So the reel is running flat out and it's actually taking your crop and throwing it bloody six feet in front of the machine. Um, so tell them about the reel, tell them about the real speed. You don't need to go into depth for giving them a week's training course, but just get, get him to understand how the machine works and what to look for and what not to look for. Um, calibration is very important on these things. Once it's calibrated, it works pretty well. So this is a 600 series front. You've got a smaller top auger. Um, on the 700 series front, you've got a much, much larger um, top auger. So that will, these ones here, most of the time you'll grab canola and the, we'll feed the canola in. With a larger top crop auger, it will grab wheat and barley because it's so deep. So it will grab it and feed it in. Speed of the top auger, basically the speed of the belts. Um, we don't want it any slower than what the belt is moving. It could be a little bit faster, if anything. And then the dealership also is making up a paddle that goes in between the two augers there, just to push that, yeah. that canola down. So people are trying different things. The key is to try and see what's going to work for you. Strongly recommend you look at the resources that are on GRDC, but also go to the, the at harvest lot at Harvest Loss app on um, handle on Twitter. Who uses Twitter? Who's heard of Twitter? Okay. <laughs> so if you know of Twitter, you can go on there and you'll, you'll see that there's guys and girls sharing what they've done and, and throwing up questions and you'll get responses from the people here as well as from others to go, this is what's going on. And it's a great way to learn.